Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blick Facebook Live. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, today, we have a very special guest artist. Jenya uh, Gershman is joining us today from uh, the sunny state of California. Jenya uh, is an internationally renowned painter of the human condition. Her primary focus is portraiture in the human form with elements of expressionism and mysticism woven in. Uh, she was born in Moscow and had her first solo exhibition at age 14 in her home country and then came to the United States and attended the Art Center College of Design, uh, earning her MFA there. Uh, since then, uh, she's had widespread recognition in large exhibitions throughout the U.S., including Art Chicago and, and also created uh, portraits of some of the 20th century's most influential musical artists, including Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan for the Music Cares Grammy Foundation. Jenya uh, is multi-talented in, in that she is also an educator, having founded her own art center, the Z Art Academy, where she teaches artists of all ages how to build their painting skill with work from live models, portfolio reviews, exhibitions, and more. Uh, she holds recognition as an art historian as well, uh, and has the, uh, a discovery under her belt of a previously unknown Rembrandt self-portrait in his painting, uh, Dene, uh, her account of which was published by Arian at Boston University. Um, recently, uh, one of her uh, newest accomplishments is that she's an ad adjudicator for the City Panel Grants in Los Angeles. Uh, today, she's going to be taking us through uh, how to paint darker skin tones using Rembrandt oil paints. So let me uh, welcome you all to this uh, Facebook Live event, and we're excited to have her. Take it away, Genia. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And uh, there is a first for everything. This was the first time I was ever introduced by an invisible person. So that was very, it felt very special. And <laughs> having said that, um, there is a whole invisible team of Blick who are amazing at putting these events. So I, I just want to quickly shout out to Ashley, Todd, Rachel, Tessa, and Ryan, and so many more who are making these events possible. They're all invisible sitting back there making sure that you have the best experience. So I want to just thank them from the bottom of my heart. And I'm going to start by sharing a little PowerPoint. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to introduce you to um, a little bit about my, who I am and my work um, so you can feel a little bit more connected to me. And then we're going to go into the demo. We're going to get dirty today. All right, let me just make sure that the PowerPoint is starting. So slideshow from the beginning. All right, here we go. So I wanted to welcome you to my studio. You are in California, in sunny California, and this place is very special to me. I believe that the studio should not only be a place for making art, but it should be place for making connections, contacts, uh, creativity with your environment, with your friends, with your colleagues, uh, with the community. So I just wanted to show you that it could look very pristine uh, with my painting showing almost like an exhibition, but very quickly it transforms into a making, an art making place uh, where my academy meets. Currently we meet on Zoom, but uh, when we're allowed back in, we make it really messy together and we have live models. But also it's a place for exhibitions where I feature students work because I really believe in promoting uh, uh, younger artists, um, artists who haven't been practicing a long time and making them more feeling more confident. This is one of my goals today is to make you more confident about your own art journey. I also even host concerts, uh, music, uh, where we look at art and how it looks differently with the sound. And every night, or I wish it was every night, but once in a while, it ends with a tango party. So if you are in Los Angeles, make sure to look me up because we do tango. So welcome to uh, looking at my work together. These are the latest pieces. And actually, I was really excited when I, this is my second time doing a live event for Blick. And they have come back to me and asked if I could actually show uh, some of my little secrets of how to paint darker skin. And I jumped up at this opportunity because uh, this is actually really at the bottom of my heart, something that's exciting for me. And I want to share where we fail with the boundaries of language, we succeed with unlimited potential of paint. And this is, you know, I'm sure that might be a question, why do I paint? Why do I love oil painting? And that is the capacity 
capacity that the oil paint, and I love using Rembrandt oil paint, Rembrandt brand, the capacity that it has for crossing our stereotypes. So in our language, in English, we would call black and white skin, and there already lies a lie, because when we come to oil paint, we do not use almost ever black or white colors. We actually use every other possible color to render light and shadow. So here is a very recent a painting of mine, and I just want to say that it's always done from a model. Um, in this case, the model could not come to my studio so Joel uh, was photographed by a very dear friend of mine, Nadia Balitska, a professional photographer uh, who uh, uh, took pictures of photo shoot outdoors and then provided me with the source images. And in this way, I was still connected to Joel. I still, I talked to him, I expressed my idea, I wanted him to present himself as he is, not as somebody else, but really connect with the, me and therefore with you, the viewer. So thank you, Joel. I hope you're watching. Uh, his name is Virgil Verset, a beautiful musician. Um, and here he's uh, talking to you. He is connecting with you, the audience. I just wanted to show you the scale of this painting. Uh, this painting is in my studio and you can see I don't sit down when I paint. It's a very physical process. I'm always standing, running back and forth, always stumbling into something, turning something over. Uh, uh, but it's important for me to be physical with my paintings, to see them from different uh, uh, points of view. And talking about the points of view, I'm taking you a little bit closer. Here you could see that um, I incorporate not only brushes, but we'll see today I use various sculpting tools to get the paint more three-dimensional, more uh, coming out of the surface, and at the same time to um, re uh, to increase this illusion, I love to put flatter backgrounds. So here I actually used a silver paint that looks almost like silver leaf and the painting always looks different from different viewing points. I also wanted you to note that this is not a passive painting. A lot of times we are taught to look at art, but I always teach my students to talk with art, to engage with art. And I think when we're talking to art, uh, it will talk back. So here you see Joel actually speaking. His lips are uh, parting. He is about to say something to you. If only you could listen, he's going to share some ideas with you. Um, you'll see that every single muscle in his face is engaged. I hope you see that. And the pendant to this piece is uh, also the title is Respiro, Respiro 1 and the Respiro 2. Respiro means breath um, and uh, it's a poetic and, and um, uh, interesting title that can have multiple interpretations. And this is a portrait of a model that I really love. Her name is Cassie Hamilton. I hope Cassie is watching as well. She's come many times to my studio. She's an actress, phenomenal uh, woman. and. Um, what I'm trying to do here, again, there's a flat background that is actually done with red gesso. And we're gonna talk about gessos and preparing the canvases a lot today. Um, you'll actually see some of my secrets that I'm hoping to share with you. Uh, so here, instead of the silver uh, paint, we have that red gesso, which is kind of flat. The paint itself, the oil paint looks dimensional and you'll notice that she's unfinished and she's unfinished on purpose. I truly believe that every viewer should be an active painter. So even if they're not painter by calling, they could be a painter as a viewer. They can complete the painting with the artist. It requires work on both of our parts. We come a little bit closer. Again, uh, every painting, in my opinion, should be rewarding, rewarding with the technique of the artist that you cannot tell from far away, like a landscape. I'm thinking about these paintings like large landscapes. If you're far away, you see the hills and the atmosphere, but when you get a little bit closer um, and closer and closer, you'll actually see the earth. You'll see the texture of the grass. You'll smell the, the, the what's coming to you from the flowers. So the painting should reveal itself and you should be able to get an inch away and still find something new. And here I show you all the colors. This is darker skin, but you will not really see brown or black. You'll see reds and blues and magentas and purples. And it all works in tandem. So when we back away, the illusion is that something convincing, but we get closer. Uh, we notice that this is very expressive, more of an emotional state of a portrait than just simple observation.
I wanted to show you three of my students, and this is a surprise to them. So um, I'm featuring these particular, I have about 40 students uh, today. And so I love them all. Uh, the reason I'm featuring these three students, not only because they're magnificent, but they all work with the same model. They created the portrait of Kasi, and you just saw my version. And I wanted to show you how they took their own interpretation. So on the right, you see a painting uh, by Robin Friend, who's uh, been painting for many years. She's a beautiful artist and she has much more of a classical Renaissance training. Uh, it almost feels like she painted it in egg tempera. You'll notice she added the jewelry. I couldn't paint jewelry like she does. Incredible detail, beautiful work. In the middle, we have Nadia Balitska, who is a photographer I mentioned to you earlier. And she's newer to painting, but uh, really has this great vision. Um, you could see the rendition from light to dark, a kind of uh, the point of view that almost only a photographer can see or is used to. And on the left, I'm very proud of, of Margaret Sachs because this was one of her first oil portraits and she was able to hang in and learn by Zoom and it's quite expressive and modern. And I just wanted to show you the range and the um, engagement with Cassie from not just myself, but also from my students. I jump here from my, uh, my own times and my own students to my master teachers and my master teachers going back in time because that's what art can do. We can time travel and we we'll look at Andrea Mantegna and I start here. I'm just going to move um, something that you don't see, but it's covering my screen so I could see the dates. Uh, this is a painting that was done in around 1500, so 500 years ago. And why I show it to you? Because it's extremely important for our subject. The next five minutes, I'm gonna quickly take you through uh, the history of painting darker skin in Western European art. Because prior to Mantegna, it was very, very rare to see an African man or woman portrayed. And if they were portrayed in a Western European art, they were portrayed in the background, inferior, and often in the role of a servant. And even in a painting like this, the subject of this painting is adoration of the Magi, uh, which is supposed to be multicultural. It represents what at the time uh, the European man thought as three continents of the world, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And Africa is supposed to be represented by black men. Even in a painting like this, the black man was painted almost outside the painting, a really tiny figure. And Andrea Mantegna was one of the first artists to not only honor uh, the position of the Africa or the black man within the painting, but he was almost elevated superior to everybody else. If you notice, the baby Jesus is in the center, but our man, Balthazar, is raised above on the right. And I just want to take you closer. Um, at the time, this is 1500s, um, most artists preferred pure colors. So in order to paint his skin, he's not really using brown or black, but a combination of primary colors colors that are mixed in order to appear darker. And when you add a little bit more red or a little bit more yellow or a little bit more blue, you start seeing the variation. So on the cheek, I, I bet you can notice a little bit of redness or on the forehead, a little bit more cool, a bluish tone. And this is how Mantegna achieves it. Skipping uh, 160 years forward, my idol, Rembrandt van Rijn. I hope that you equally love him. You cannot love him more than me because he's mine, but equally love me as, as I do. And this particular painting I wanted to share with you because I had a private experience with it. I was in Holland in Maurits house in Hague. And this is a museum where the girl with the pearl earring hangs, the very famous Vermeer painting after which a movie was done, a book was done. It's so famous. It's considered like a Dutch Mona Lisa. In the same museum, there's a collection of Rembrandt paintings. And I was passing down the hallway and I saw this. And this painting is actually much brighter in reproduction than it is in real life. It's a very somber painting. And it stopped me in my tracks. When you look a little bit closer, there is such intimacy, there is such warmth, there's such connection and simplicity. It's simply one of the most gorgeous paintings I've ever seen Rembrandt do. And um, it is considered one of the first painting in the Dutch tradition when an African man is given a primary role. So even in Mantegna, we had other characters, but here um, he is uh, these two men or perhaps there's one man from two different positions. It's not really clear, um, but 
this is the subject, the main subject of this painting. When we get a little bit closer, we notice how loosely it's painted and how very few highlights there are here. And even it will appear if you stand in front of it, and I hope you all traveled to see it at one point, um, you'll find it almost unfinished. And remember that unfinished quality that we talked about that I love in my work. Um, so Rembrandt did sign it proudly at, towards the end of his life, this painting is made. So he considered this this kind of unfinished finished style as something that he wanted to le leave to the viewer up to their imagination. Um, I wanted to uh, actually feature the paint that made Rembrandt's painting possible. And this is really funny because uh, this is the color, burnt umber, that made Rembrandt's work the way that it is now, uh, glowing with that warm, uh, beautiful golden light. Uh, but the company has chosen Rembrandt's name to name it. So even though that's the paint that help Rembrandt, Rembrandt helps the paint. Here's his name, the Rembrandt oil paint. Um, I happen to be a Rembrandt ambassador. I absolutely fall in love with this paint and uh, it's a wonderful marriage. Um, I'm proud to promote it. I use it and all of my students use it with great pleasure. The reason that we love it is because the moment it comes out of the tube, it has a perfect consistency, so delicious that you can't wait to paint with it. And I hope that you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So why burnt umber? Burnt umber is actually one of the oldest paints there is. It's basically an earth pigment. And um, even uh, thousands of years ago in the Stone Age, we find it in the cave paintings. So this is really something, there's something really primary to it, but it has a kind of um, pot potential to go from light to dark that other brown pigments don't. It could become really transparent and light or really dense and dark. And from that, um, we have paintings really like Vermeer or Rembrandt. And if you look at this incredible Vermeer on the left, and forget about the milkmaid and just look at the wall behind her and notice that glowing light, that famous glowing light that's coming and streaming into the, to the painting from the warm grays that actually has some of the burnt umber in them to the almost golden ones on the right side. This is what this paint is able to achieve. At the same time, if you look on the Rembrandt on the right, you could see again the ember glow and the darkness that it's able to achieve. The range is really incredible. And I'm very happy to share that uh, Blick is doing a great promotion. So uh, starting today, you can actually, if you buy one tube, you get one for free. Buy one, get one free. So BOGO promotion. All you have to do is uh, check it out from the cart and it'll automatically happen. So uh, a little tiny self-promotion since I'm showing you Vermeer and my collaboration with Rembrandt Paint, uh, which is uh, the company that produces it, is called Royal Talents. And since I'm an ambassador for Royal Talents North America, um, I collaborate on a program that's called Invisible Museum Tours. And we offer it once a month. And it's a wonderful way to travel to museums across the world and look at the best works of art in an engaging and informative way. And there's one episode, episode number six, coming this Monday. So at Facebook Live, Royal Talents North America will focus on Vermeer. So if I picked your curiosity and you wanted to know anything about and more that you ever wanted to know about Vermeer, please join us this Monday, 10 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. It was shameless self-promotion. Okay, just a couple of more works of art before we get dirty. I wanted to uh, uh, feature this French artist, Theodore Jericho. So we are skipping to 19th century. You could see in 10 minutes, we are flying through art history. And I wanted to introduce this incredible study of a model um, of an African man. And uh, this happened to be a favorite model of the artist and they became even friends. And he used him for a very famous painting that hangs today at the Louvre Museum. And it's called the Raft of the Medusa. If you don't know it, please Please take a look at it. It was a dramatic, it was actually a political event, dramatic event where uh, a ship was recklessly left to float and a few passengers, about 118 passengers uh, were able to survive on a raft. 
and they were left to float in the open ocean for uh, many days, 13 days. And uh, at the end, only 13, I think, survived or very few survived. And Jericho chose to paint the subject matter. It was so controversial and so upsetting and so uh, like so many people were uh, even appalled by it because he showed uh, decaying bodies floating in the sea. And he used this model to um, model for one of the characters who is hoping, who's holding on to the mast and hoping for survival. And so it's such a poignant portrait. It almost speaks to us today uh, while we are in isolation during an international crisis of COVID. And we're looking for hope. We understand that there is death surrounding us. And we're hoping that our raft will catch its destination and will be rescued. I find it really moving. And in this painting, you'll notice that rather than just using the whites for the highlights, he's actually using turquoise blue. And I'm going to be featuring turquoise blue and how it functions uh, together with terra verde, a beautiful green color uh, in the highlights, in the darker skin. So right away, I wanted to attract your attention to this. Of course, burnt umber, you could already notice uh, mixed in into the blue and the greens, making this painting having a more deeper glow to it. And finally, I wanted to feature a contemporary artist. Um, this is done by an artist who lives in London. Uh, and uh, she's uh, from, um, let's see, she, her, her heritage is from Ghana and actually a female artist. So I'm really proud to share Lynette with you. Uh, Tate Modern hosted her exhibition and considered Lynette one of the most important living artists today. And you just love what she does with the darker skin. First of all, her quote, she says, I do not use black pigment. It completely deadens things. I use a mixture of brown and blue instead. And she's saying this, and this is true, but in this painting, she introduces something else. She's using not just brown um, and blue, but she's using yellow, lemon, predominantly lemon yellow or bright yellow uh, to function as the highlight. And if you notice, the painting is called citrine, which is a yellow topaz, and it comes from the word lemon, citron in French. And I'm sure she called it, um, I, I'm guessing that she called it because of the use of yellow in this uh, painting. So I just wanted to share with you the possibilities of color through this history from then to now and as artists are practicing and hoping to inspire you to experiment and invent new ways of painting darker skin. So I end my little PowerPoint with my Z Art Academy where I train all ages and all styles and I hope you check it out because also all of the materials that I'm mentioning today, um, there's going to be a link in the chat um, for the streaming today and you can click there and you'll be able to order anything that I mentioned that spoke to you and you found useful. So I really encourage you to use this resource. So I'm going to stop here for a moment and see if we have any questions and we're going to go to a demo in a moment. I will just mention for the viewers here that we have so many people from across the country and the world joining us today. Uh, hello to Carolyn from Georgia. Hello to uh, Patty. Hello to uh, Wayne from Grand Rapids. Uh, we have people from the Netherlands. We have people from Costa Rica. Deb from Vermont, so people from all over the country. Uh, don't hesitate to let us know where you're, where you're watching from. We're, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, Todd, for that. And there's, of course, my daughter from upstairs, too. Um, <laughs> um, I wish I could hear everybody laugh. I, I'm going to have to laugh to my own jokes. So I, I'm switching my view camera to my palette. I'm going to back at the end of the demonstration. You're going to hear my voice. You're going to hear Todd's voice with your comments and questions. Uh, you're going to see my demonstrations, my live demonstrations, my palette. But I will disappear for a moment and I'll be back towards the end. Let's do this. So welcome to my palette. I'm just going to focus very quickly. Here we go. Have to learn how to use all this technology in the last few months. And here is my beautiful tube 
it's a little large. You don't need a tube that big unless you're painting a huge painting. So you totally fall in love with this paint. Of course, you can have it. But I'm always paranoid that I'm going to run out of paint. So I always order my huge tubes of Rembrandt paint. And this is burnt, burnt sienna. So I love how clear and easy uh, Rembrandt marks their colors. They're named in different languages. And up here at the very top, you'll actually see um, if the paint is translucent or opaque, there's a little square that you'll be able to see on your tube. And if it's clear, it's uh, translucent. And if it's dark, it's opaque. You can't see through it. It's more has more body. And then if it shows a triangle through, it shows you kind of an in-between stage. So this is a semi-translucent semi paint. It's a very beautiful burnt sienna. Uh, bur no, I don't want burnt sienna. I want burnt umber. One second. Let me grab that. Burnt umber. That's the color that I'm featuring to you. Now, since I had burnt sienna, I might as well show you the gorgeous difference between these two colors. And uh, burnt sienna is going to be darker and more, uh, sorry, it's going to be lighter and redder. And burnt umber is going to be richer and more uh, chocolate. You can see the difference. All right, so what I want to show you today first, we have three things on your menu. For appetizer, I'm going to show you how burnt umber, how it looks when you put a translucent layer of burnt umber on various backgrounds, how it acts, how does the paint act as it reaches and meets different colors. So that's really important to know. And in technical terms, we call this glazing. And I wonder if uh, many of you had heard of this uh, term. It actually comes from optics. So I want you to think about glazing because look at how opaque this color looks. But in a moment, we're going to make it look translucent. So glazing comes from optics. Imagine looking at the world through sunglasses looking at the sunset through sunglasses. It's going to look very different uh, than putting on pink glasses or yellow glasses. It's going to tint the way you experience reality. So a lot of the technique in oil is actually based on what kind of glaze, what kind of color you chose to dilute with a, pig, uh, with a medium and add to your painting. So how do we do that? We need two things to create a glaze. Number one, besides the color. We need turpentine. Uh, for your paint, turpentine is basically like water, only it is a toxic. So you want to have great ventilation in your studio. Um, you don't want to pour it on your hands. You want to be careful with that. But painting with it is safe if you are uh, using safe methods. This is actually by Royal Talents, a uh, turpentine that's orderless. So if I pour it into my large jar, I'm not going to be intoxicated by the smell. I'm really not going to notice it in my room. So I really love this product. And the other thing that we need, so remember, turpentine is like water. Think about watercolor. It's going to dilute your pigment, make it stretch, make it run, and in a way, take the color, the luminosity out of it. On the other hand, oil medium will do the opposite. Oil medium will give the body to the paint, make it thicker and more lustrous and shiny. And you need both. It's not one or the other. A mistake that is commonly made, artists try to paint with one or the other. Don't do that. Uh, you will lose the capacity of the paint uh, of becoming different properties. It's really oil paint is magical. It's able to transform in so many different ways. So please use both. This is poppy seed oil. I love this product. Uh, there are different types of oils you can use. And they determine the speed at which your paint will dry. So poppy seed is a medium speed. It really gives me a great ability to fuss with my painting. So if I paint something today, I'll have an entire week to still change my mind and the paint won't be dry yet, right? It'll take about two weeks to three weeks for the painting to dry fully. So love this material. So in my little dirty jar, I'm gonna put some poppy seed oil. And you only need very little. This is a powerful thing for my huge paintings. A little bottle like that goes for about a month. So very wonderful material. 
Okay, just want to show you a couple of things that happened to the paint. So here is a burnt umber. I'm going to take a little turpentine and as you notice I'm kind of getting it off my brush back to the can because it's also very powerful. Look at how it's going to make the paint run, right? It's going on my palette. One thing you, I'm going to tell you the do's and the don'ts. The don't, do not dip your brush straight into the paint. It's going to contaminate your brush and you won't have control. So I always suggest grab a little bit, almost like from the bottom of the paint and drag it out. Now notice how the paint property is changing right away. I love using this Princeton brushes. Um, I love the brush that has a long handle, long neck, flat, beautiful edge. This is something, and they're very inexpensive synthetic brushes and they last a very long time. I just love them. Okay, so this is what the paint will look like out of the tube with turpentine. Let's add some poppy seed to it. So I'm just gonna grab a little poppy seed, make sure that I'm getting it on my brush and look at it over here to the left. You'll actually notice the color of the paint is richer. Do you see how the turpentine made it uh, more washed out and the oil made it richer, darker? So at some points you want to vary, vary your approach. You don't always want to paint the same. That's why we use both. One makes it stretchy, one makes it lustrous and gives it body. So two, two different ideas. All right, I'm actually going to get the paint out of my brush for a moment. So I'm not going to waste it. I'm just going to get it all on my palette. I can use all of this. And after I've done that, I'll dip it in my turpentine. It also acts as a cleaner. And I'll just wipe my brush clean. It's ready here, set for me when I need it. For glazing, it's nicer to use a larger brush. You could use brushes, depending on the size of your canvas, uh, that are about size six or eight, to a larger, really large brush, to even house brushes. So I use all kinds of range of brushes for glazing. So let's use, uh, which one should we use? Let's use this one for now. And um, I hope that you can see uh, we, uh, my painting. So we're going to switch to the view. Todd, can we see both? Right now we're seeing your palette. I think we have a, a Blick Fairies that can make it uh, that we could see both. Let's get them to help here. One <laughs> second. All right. So I have prepared in the meantime, you see how, how what I was talking about invisible help is I'm going to get so spoiled. Uh, so I've prepared something for you. This is a canvas that I bought uh, straight out of the store, but I just sewed it. I put a protective acrylic layer um, on it. And that's what gives the, the, the perfect surface. You never want to go straight onto the canvas that you buy out of the store without doing the step. And on my website, there is a portal for gesso and I actually explain every step of the way how to prepare your canvas. I highly recommend it. It's a free site, so please use it uh, for uh, your to help you. So, but I, what I've done is actually I created different steps, different gessos. Uh, depending on the color of your gesso, the outlook of your painting will change. So you could be starting the painting from red canvas, or you could be starting your painting from black canvas, and that will dramatically change the mood and the look and the psychological impact of your portrait. So here I made a little almost like a uh, school 101 demonstration, but I really want to show it to you. Uh, by the way, the gessos that I love they come in these little bags and uh, this is a whole buying product and they come in multiple colors. They're already pre-mixed to just go straight and a beautiful surface. You don't have hi, to- Hi, Genya. It. I'm gonna break in here real fast. Uh, we are, we're just having a little bit of trouble switching over to that painting view, view for a second. So if you want to show the customers the product, uh, switch it over to the palette view um, and and put it right under there for, for the customer. Okay, and so um, just so that you know, uh, the painting view is my, yeah, there you go. Um, it just jumped, right? There we go. That, it that just was, switched over for us. Thank yeah, you. That was, my, <laughs> that was my camera, actually, where my face used to be. Okay, uh, thank you for doing that. So I'm going to remember that on my palette, and you can still see me grabbing the paint off my palette on the smaller view. I'm going to dip my brush into turpentine, get that turpentine off, even blot it a little bit, get the poppy seed, 
uh, get the paint on my brush, work it into my palette. And now I'm going to start at the very top just to show you. So if I put burnt umber onto the white, look what happens. Look at how it shines through. This is um, like a beige color that I created. Look at how that looks on that. Then we have actually oil underpainting with burnt umber underpainted. Look at orange. Look at how the burnt umber looks at orange. You see how translucent it is? Now you'll see what the glaze really means. It means that the other colors are coming straight through it. And it's actually changing our perception of that color. Look at how the blue is becoming slightly green uh, by mixing with a glaze of burnt umber. And now we're going to this gray and even on black, even if I raise a little bit, you'll see even when I go in black, you'll be able to see burnt umber affecting it. Look at this beautiful transition. Now, what you can do with glaze is I can take a large brush and I can go right over it and kind of even it out, make it translucent. And look how I'm going to make it disappear. You're not going to see that stripe anymore. I'm going to work in in that area. But still, this does not look the same as that. This looks naked compared to that deep glow. Remember how we talked about Vermeer's wall? Look at that white. This is that glow, Vermeer's wall, um, diluting the light. Or this is that dark of Rembrandt, if I turn it upside down so you could see. The glow of Rembrandt in the dark, all done with the burnt umber. What a beautiful color. Look at this. Look at the, uh, how dull this looks compared to a glazed surface. Now, Renaissance artists did not stop there. They would let their glaze dry and they would come back multiple times with various glazes. Titian, who was one of the greatest Renaissance painters along with Leonardo, a Venetian artist, was known to glaze some of his paintings 30 coats. And that's when you when you stand in front of his artwork. So if you stand in front of Mona Lisa, you will notice that glow and also the edges become imperceptible. How did they do it? They did it by glazing. So in order to show you how the glaze actually looks on a painting, this is uh, not a portrait I did for myself. This is a portrait I did as part of my Zoom teaching technique where I was teaching, remember Margaret's painting, I was featuring my student. I was doing this for her so she could follow along uh, even though she was not next to me. So I'm going to glaze it. This is a portrait of Kasi. This is a photograph here as a reference. And I'm going to glaze it to show you how the colors will change. So I hope you're excited about that. Todd, if we have any comments or questions, I'm happy to hear them. Yes, we do. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. Um, Mary would like to know if you're using an acrylic primer on your canvas. Correct. So Mary, thank you for asking. The primer, the gesso I was talking about is in acrylic. So this is, but do not mistake acrylic or acrylic paint or acrylic primer with um, acrylic gesso. Gesso primer, the word you use is actually equivalent, uh, um, is not acrylic paint. It has a different consistency, a softer consistency. So if I uh, use acrylic paint, it would look plasticky and sticky and oil paint does not like to go over it. It will separate and look kind of ugly. It doesn't like to adhere to it. While acrylic gesso or acrylic primer has the right chalky consistency that's so delicious that when you begin painting with oil on top, it just sinks. So that was a very important question. All right, so I'm loading my brush. Can you see me kind of loading in that little screen? with the burnt umber again and I'm going to go over let's go over this left side no this is light so let's not do that here let's put a darker shadow with our glaze so it would make sense let's start with the hair do you see the difference right away this is translucent paint look at that on that side and then through the eye and even touching the eye and then through the cheekbone, following the anatomy, and then down this way into the jaw. Let's hit a little bit around the mouth and to the side of the nose and into the eye a little bit on the left side. And then immediately into the neck. Do you see, I'm, I can't mess up my painting because the layer underneath is totally dry. And so 
uh, when you do your glazes, you want to usually do it on dry painting that's dry underneath that you've underpainted. Take a look what happens when I glaze the red part. Look how gorgeous that's going to look. I hope you agree with me that look how translucent, how light it is, but how lively it becomes. It's almost like magic. Whenever I show it to my students, I feel like I'm a magician, only uh, I'm revealing my secret to you. And Zhenya, uh, while you're going here, I just want to let you know uh, when the customers are watching, they can only see your uh, painting as we go. So they can't see your the small thumbnail. The smaller of your palette. palette right okay. Now. We, also, we also do have another question uh, from a viewer. Um, uh, Bruce would like to know the significant dif difference with using poppy seed oil. Okay. Yes, it is. Bruce, thank you. It is a significant difference. Do you see how my painting is changing? Todd, since I can't hear all the oohs and ahs, you're going to have to ooh and ah for me. I think we're all mentally doing it for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's so funny in isolation. I have to like clap myself, right? Okay. So uh, Bruce, I believe, asked, um, there is a significant difference for me between poppy seed oil, walnut oil, and uh, linseed oil. These are predominant three oils that are usually used in oil painting. The poppy seed oil, if I show it to you uh, through my camera right now, uh, through the bottom, let me figure out which way to go. Okay, do you see it through the glass? It's really almost white. If you look at linseed oil, it's yellow. So linseed and walnut oil will actually make your colors slightly orangey it will shift the the actual hue of your colors poppy seed preserves the authenticity of the color and that's very important to me because i feel like it's more contemporary um, if you love the look of uh, all the masters then linseed oil is the way to go but for poppy seed oil it looks more contemporary more money to me than it does uh like old masters the other thing like i mentioned uh, it's this the drying speed is a little bit slower a walnut is the believe the longest and linseed is the fastest and poppy seed is in the middle. And if I got it wrong, I am the artist today, so everything I say is right, right? <laughs> I Absolutely. And you should see the comments. <laughs> we have so many customers ooing and eyeing right now for you. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. So notice how I worked it in that. I've been doing something. I've been just basically taking my brush and working in my glaze. So if you look at it, it's really uniform. You don't notice that veil of color. I worked it in so it looks seamless. Now watch, I can even go over the eye. Watch, uh, let me mess it up. Let me make a mistake because I actually think that will teach you even more than making it perfect. Let me cover that eye and make it really dark. You see, it's still glazed through, but that's too much. All I have to do is clean my brush with turpentine, dry it out a little bit and go over and remove some of that glaze. I can even use a little bit of my uh, rag here and look, I'm restoring the original, but a deeper glow. Look how beautiful that looks. That's really different, right? I prefer this so much more to what it was a few seconds ago. So you can really play with glazes. This red still looks red. It didn't look like a different color, but it's deeper. It's more emotional. The edges are softer. So that's really uh, my demonstration of burnt umber and what glazes can do. And uh, no, there's no reason why you can't work in a little bit of blue into your glaze, a little bit of red into your glaze by adding drops of other colors and varying it. I just wanted to show you the simplicity of one color, but of course you can uh, create variations. Now, if I don't have any more questions on this stage, I'm going to go to the next level of our demonstration today. Yep, okay. go right ahead, Genia. Uh, All we're right. watching the comments here. All right, so take that. Uh, let's leave it there. I'm just going to put it on top. So these are a few canvases that I prepared. Um, and they all have different colored gessos. So this is actually a, a raw sienna. This is orange. I hope you're taking notes. Because I'm going to ask you right now, our audience, this is black. And this is red. 
which one you prefer that I create my demonstration. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to create how to begin a portrait in oil, how to actually to go about from nothing to a portrait. And you have a choice between these four colors. And I've instructed Todd to really look for your comments. So speak out or forever hold your peace. Which one of these four colors would you well, like everyone, to let see? Us, let us know in the comments what you'd like to see her paint on. All right. In the meantime, and if you don't choose, I'll choose for you. But how much fun if you get your a la carte, if you actually uh, ask the artist, right? And uh, I love to be able to adjust. So what I'm going to be doing while I'm waiting for that answer, um, I'm not going to, I only have about 20 minutes left of our time together. And what I want to show you, not to how to complete the painting, because in a way, this was the stage of how you would complete it. But I want to show you how to start, how to begin, how to to develop and I'm going to sketch out directly and paint on a prepared color gesso and then just take one area. I think I'm going to take uh, the mouth today and really develop that forward. So I wonder if the public has spoken. Yep, I would say this isn't scientific, of course, Shenya, but we're seeing a lot of orange and red. So let's go ahead and, and let you decide between those two and we'll, we'll go from there. And uh, I swear I did not tip Todd to choose that because this is my favorite. So um, <laughs> you think that he was planted, but he's honest. All right, absolutely my favorite. You'll see a lot of red in my work. I just adore it. So we're going to start by painting directly with, um, and actually with burnt umber. We're gonna lay out the painting. And we just, with oil paint, if you thin it down and load it the way I taught you at the end of the brush, you can actually draw quite precise, uh, almost like you don't need charcoal, you don't need chalk to start or pencil. You can draw with paint. And this is one of the misconceptions in art. Uh, I'm sure you heard about this. Learn how to draw before you learn how to paint. This is truly a misconception because when we paint, we draw. And when we draw, we paint. And if you take my class, you'll find out exactly what I mean because I say it very often. But this is very important that just because the material is liquid, you don't think that you're not painting. I'm gonna raise this a little bit so you could see the bottom part. Okay, here we go. And what I'm trying to show is the position of the head. You notice I didn't go for the eyes. I just went straight for the large position and the tilt of the head. This is what's important to me. And you see how burnt umber looks almost red. You think that I'm using red paint, right? Remember, it's a translucent color. So it paints so beautifully. So I'm just sketching out where the head will be, what the proportions will be. Um, I'm not marrying this painting. I always say you want to date your painting before you marry it. Meaning that I'm not committing. This, this is all movable. Okay, let's find, and look, I haven't reloaded my brush. This is why I love Rembrandt paint. It just goes and goes and goes. You see, with that little bit of my brush, I love the quality, the, the pigment, the, um, the amount of pigment per binder is so strong that the paint is really luscious. This is really what you want in your oil paint. So I'm just kind of laying it out. It doesn't have to be precise. I just want to feel where where she is in space. Again, we only have 15, 20 minutes, so there's so much I can do. And you know what she would look like if it was finished by looking at my portraits that I demonstrated to you. All right, let's just get a little bit more paint, a little bit more burnt, burnt umber. Let's look at the potential of this paint. Now, remember, it would look totally different if we used orange, if we used blue, or if we used brown or black. So you're underpainting. Um, how do you decide what color you want to use? It's an emotional aspect, right? It's that color that will glow through and it will determine the response of the viewer. So your underpainting determines the, the kind of the tonality, the almost like a music tone to what the how the viewers will perceive it. 
So this is always going to stay. What is the tonality of this painting? It's always going to be fiery on the edge, in your face, warm, glowy, uh, slightly disturbing. Red is really strong, right? So even though when I'll cover it, and you'll see, it'll still affect the way we read the paint. So I'm moving the chin a little higher, a little lower, just trying to find this. So I'm going to leave it this sketchy. And I'm actually, I wish you could see my palette. Maybe we could see my palette for a moment. Maybe the magicians could make it happen. I am going to switch a palette really quick. Okay, I'm going to go away from, uh, Todd, is it possible to see my palette very quickly? We're getting that set up for you here momentarily, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. That was quicker than I thought. Thank you. I'm going to move that away so you could see it better. Um, it's important that you see my palette for a moment <clears throat> because I want to show you the potential of these colors and the way that I arrange them. In my previous demonstrations, I explained that I separate the colors by light and dark. So you have lighter colors on this uh, side and darker colors as we go. So that's really convenient. So this is, think about speech. This would be kind of quiet colors and it gets louder and we separating our capacity. The same thing I do for warm and cool. So all of my yellows and reds are on one side, eventually through the browns. We end with greens, blues, and purples. There is no black on my palette. We're painting darker skin. There is no black, just like uh, the artist that I was talking about, the quote by her, don't use black to create darker skin. Uh, there is white here. And the reason the white is here is only because I had it from the previous painting and I didn't want to throw it away. I'm probably not going to use it today. My white is probably going to start not even with this Naples yellow. This is a, like a slightly diluted white with a little bit of yellow, but it's probably going to start with my yellow ochre. Uh, yellow ochre, I'm going to call them out uh, very quickly because this is recorded and you can always rewatch it. And also all these colors are on my website, so you can grab the links um, and order them as I mention them a little bit later. So yellow ochre, raw sienna, and uh, look at the difference between yellow ochre and rosiana. Many people make a mistake of just buying one and not the other, but one is golden and light. One is more like a uh, straw, more natural, just absolutely gorgeous. We have raw sienna and burnt sienna. I already mentioned raw umber and burnt umber. What is the difference? One is the pure form of the other. Raw sienna is untouched. Burnt sienna is literally means that it's been altered by fire by burning the, and darkening the same properties, uh, turning them a little darker. So same with raw and burnt umber. Today I'm featuring burnt umber. Raw umber is the same paint, just haven't, haven't been uh, uh, treated with fire uh, or heat. So here we have cadmium red. This is the same color of my underpainting. It's my favorite color, absolutely, for whether I'm going out to dance tango in my tango shoes or my painting, equally love it. Uh, this is um, a permanent matter deep, uh, which is kind of like a magenta color, but really gorgeous. You can't live without it. I can't live without permanent matter deep. Uh, then we have the raw umber, a little bit of raw umber. They look almost the same out of the tube, but you notice that when we dilute it, it'll be a lighter color and burnt umber is darker. And I actually have three browns here. The last one is Van Dyke Brown, which is one of my favorite colors as well. And we quickly go to the cools, which is Terra Verde or Green Earth, a color that I adore in Rembrandt paint, Terra Verde. Uh, there's nothing like it for both landscapes and portraits. I know that my fellow um, ambassadors and royal talent will support that this is an incredible color. Another color I can't live without is turquoise blue. Again, amazing for landscapes and portraits. We quickly go to ultramarine deep blue, which is almost my black. And then finally to the ultramarine violet, uh, which is going to give a gorgeous tones to the painting. So I just wanted to show you, I'm going to be pulling these colors and mixing together. And before we switch to the other view, I'm actually going to show you how I do that. 
and then we'll go back to the painting. So I'm going to uh, use my turpentine and use my poppy seed. And remember that I'm dipping into both. Always turpentine first because it's powerful and it'll wash away your poppy seed. Now I'm going to drop here and I'm going to pull out. Remember how I taught you to pull out your paint, right? And if it's not going, if it's dragging, that means you don't have enough material. So you go back to your turpentine and you go back to your poppy seed. So you don't have enough if it's not going beautifully. So that's just kind of yellowish here with yellow ochre, but I want some burnt umber into it. Now look at how I'm going to br bring and pull like elastic, like a ribbon, bring my colors and mix them in the middle. So when the two meet, I get a new chemical reaction. Look at that, a new color. And I'm going to add a little bit of a, um, let's pull a little bit of that Van Dyke Brown, which is a little bit stronger paint, a little bit stronger op opaque brown. And into it, uh, Terra Verde. Let's pull Terra Verde in it. So it's not going to look green. It's already a new color. You see that? Look at that beauty. And let's pull a little bit of a burnt sienna into it. So whenever I mix, the rule is that I give to my students, mix at least three colors, hopefully more. And then we test it to the painting. So we're going to go back to the painting now. So if my Blick fairies can make it uh, the painting now the focus. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm dabbing my brush. I'm making sure it's loaded correctly. I'm activating it with a little bit. Thank you so much, Ryan. OK, so now I'm going to test it. So I'm painting the mouth. And you'll notice on the red, it looks too dark right now. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit of a Naples yellow into my paint just very quickly and adjust it. And that looks too white. I'm going to go back a little cadmium red, just going to nuance it until I get the right consistency. I'm not going to paint until I'm satisfied. Uh, maybe a little bit of it even of the ultramarine violet. Let's see what that does and a little bit more of that permanent matter deep. Look what it takes to get the right color. And this is what I started with saying black and white. My God, our language is so limited. Now that's why we have all the problems in the world. If everybody was a painter, we'd be so much kinder and understanding, right? So all of these colors. And on the other side, let's make it a little bit Let's use some red and yellow ochre for this side for the light. Now let's use more yellow ochre. I'm going to take a moment to work this up. I'm just going to use the mouth area. So forgive me. And it takes a moment to build up with oil paint. Notice that I'm working with little short strokes. I'm not blending too much. I'm allowing this area to grow kind of organic and naturally. And let's go into the lips. We're going to adjust everything multiple times and just make a little darker passage here. A upper lip is usually in a darker uh, value because of the angle of the lip. It usually doesn't catch the light unless you lit it with a flashlight from below. And the bottom lip is going to catch a little bit more light. I'm painting very thinly. I'm letting that red kind of glow through I don't need much paint in the underpainting layer. And I don't recommend doing what I'm doing, which is talking while you paint. Because you can't fully concentrate on what you're doing, right? So that's the curse of the teacher because you have to make it um, understandable for everyone. But the quality of what you're doing is suffering because you don't have your full concentration. So forgive me. I'm either a great painter or a great talker, but something in between will reach together. Yeah, it's very important. I think the studio, if you don't have your studio, your kitchen can become your studio, but your studio is your sacred. I have a student who lives on a bus and uh, she made a little corner for her studio. And I just love teaching her. Marie, if you're watching, I'm talking about you. And uh, your studio is a sacred space, whether it's a uh, size of the Louvre Museum or the corner of the bus, you want to have that kind of quiet meditative place where 
it's really sacred. I'm working with values in different colors. I hope you could see just how many colors that I'm introducing in this quick little demonstration. And while I'm doing uh, this, Todd, do we have any comments or questions? Well, we have quite a few people saying uh, that they certainly empathize with your notation on talking and painting, for sure. Um, we also have uh, a customer who joined us, Doreen from South Africa. That's really great to see. Um, and people generally commenting on how much they love uh, your philosophy, making sure that uh, you know you use your studio as a sacred space and uh, thinking like a painter when you're looking at, at flesh tones. That's beautiful. I'm so glad. I, I, my favorite thing, I, I taught 11 years at the Getty Museum. My favorite thing is to connect with the audience. And of course, it's so hard on Zoom. It's even harder when you mute it. But I'm trying to get into your hearts and minds, even though I can't hear you. I'm trying to hear, feel everyone with me, helping me paint here. And you can see, can you see how it's starting to transform in this little short time and how the red is still affecting the way we see in the color and how little, I didn't use really white at all, how little light we need to make it look luminous. Now, let me show you a trick. I'm going to go and take some Naples yellow some burnt, no, raw sienna, and I'm going to make, and a little white, let's use a little white. I'm just going to use the white to create the background, and then we're going to use some turquoise and some other things. And with the background, it's not separate, it's not something you paint after, it actually determines the position in space, the mood of your model, and you want to think not just feeling in, Sorry, that's me bumping into camera. You want to think not just uh, uh, filling in the space, but actually correcting your drawing. We talked about drawing with paint. Do you see how I kind of found that, that muscle of her anatomy on the mouth, Cassie's beautiful cheekbone? I'm going to trim and paint with the background. This is a really wonderful thing. Don't think about doing it later. Uh, this is why I wanted to show you the process. The processes work everywhere at the same time. So don't separate the, the background and foreground. Let's put a, a little bit more white into it. It's going to be fun. And we can do it even brighter. So that we have a contrast between the red in the face and the tonalities. The, the brighter, lighter tone in the background is making this look more correct. So you actually adjust one against the other, like a photographer would do with a little gray card. Is that in the past, do the photographers still do that? When they take out a little gray card to adjust for the color. Okay, so let's add some blues and purples into the, the, the face. Let me check the time. We have about one minute away from one hour mark, but um, let me just do some really fun tricks here. Uh, let's take a little bit of a turquoise blue. God, time flies when, when you're having fun and painting. I'm using turquoise blue in this highlight. Hi, Genya. Just letting you know, it looks like our Zoom feed may have been interrupted here, so oh. we may want to Take a pause. Okay. I'll you can wait. keep on. You can keep on going. Yeah, I'll we'll, keep on we'll painting check a little. The technical bit. difficulties here. Okay. All right, Jenya, it looks like we're back. Oh, great. Sorry, guys, I hope we didn't lose you. Um, I've been using a little bit of turquoise blue and a little bit of Verid um, of a Terra Verde, introducing blues and purples into the skin. Look how much more interesting it looks against the glowing red. And I'm just going to go in for just a few little touches in the mouth <clears throat> to create a little bit of a texture there. And then we're going to 
uh, complete with uh, some final thoughts and questions from you. So get ready. Um, I'm going to say an official goodbye in just a moment. But I want to put a little bit of a finesse to that mouth, a little bit of a all I can do, of course, in a short time, but still show you some fun things. I'm mixing cadmium red with a little bit of Naples yellow so I can work up some of these uh, beautiful highlights and texture in her lip. And very quickly, that's going to look juicy and like a, as if saliva, a little bit of wet saliva and three-dimensionality of the mouth, um, just with a little bit of highlight. And I'll add a little bit at the top here as well, where the skin is curving. Again, it would take me about three hours to really work up this portrait and make it beautiful. Um, and as we switch back, you could see what time can do, right? It really makes a big difference. But I wanted to, to show you my process, let you into my studio and inspire you to try it on your own. Rather than showing you something perfect, I wanted to show you something in between um, and how you would go about it. So let's put one final touch and we'll wrap it up. All right, so I'm going to switch my camera. Uh, make sure that I could see you. Okay, if we can make that primary. Working on it here for you, Zhenya. Great, and I'm looking for there your you comments and questions as we fare um, say goodbye. Well, you've inspired quite a few people here in the comments. Lots of people are, are commenting on how excited they are to, to see, you know, what you what you were doing right there. Not a lot of questions. Uh, we had quite a few uh, 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 people saying that they were just really excited to see it and um, that you were a very clear instructor. Well, it has been my pleasure. If questions do come up, however, please type them in the chat. I'll look in and try to answer them. I uh, really cherish a connection. Um, and Todd will also follow up with me if there's more questions that I haven't answered. So I'll, that our chat will be a way to communicate. You can, of course, send your question through my website, uh, zartacademy.org. Uh, just uh, uh, hit contact and go straight to my mailbox and I'll be happy to help you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Royal Talents North America for sponsoring this program. Thank you, Blick, for hosting. This has been a delight for me. Thank you everyone for joining us on Facebook Live.